So this is an introduction video about this tool, the Proxmark 3. This is an open source hardware device and it comes in many different uh, hardware form factors because it's open source and people change, uh, change things up a bit, try to, try to make improvements or to make it cheaper. Uh, this is called the Proxmark 3 Easy version and um, it's a very common uh, tool made in China, but uh, the important thing to know about the Proxmark is that it is the de facto standard tool if you want to do anything with RFID. So passive coupled devices that are in the 125 kilohertz to 134 kilohertz or low frequency range, that's this antenna here, uh, or the high frequency 13.56 megahertz, there's an antenna on the bottom PCB in this area under the under the sticker. And you can see there's an indication here on the center PCB uh, where to put high frequency tags. So the interesting thing about this <laughs> hardware is that being open source, um, you know, the software for a long time, the, both the firmware that runs in the hardware and the uh, client software that runs on the host computer, uh, they weren't necessarily the best. Um, you know, open source hardware isn't known usually for uh, a, an exemplary, you know, user experience. So uh, for the longest time, this has been a very difficult piece of hardware to use. But um, things have been improving in particular um, through the efforts of one man and, and you know, contributors that help him. Uh, but uh, Chris Herman, uh, also known as Iceman, he makes an excellent firmware uh, for, for the Proxmark and client software. And his goal is to uh, continually improve not just features, but also usability. So rather than, you know, step through, you know, step by step uh, of how to do certain things with certain commands, um, this video is just focusing on how to explore the Proxmark 3 because, you know, the different firmware versions that are out there, the different firmware branches or forks. So there's the Iceman branch, uh, but then there's also like the main branch that, uh, that it comes with. You know, all of our Proxmark 3s come with the Iceman version. Very important distinction. But, um, but the reason that it's important to, um, you know, convey how to explore it is, you know, there are different commands for different firmware versions that do the same thing, or they work slightly differently, or the syntax is different. And it really, really depends on what exact branch you have and also exa what exact version, because they can change between versions. So um, I cover how to do the firmware updates and the client uh, compilation and everything like that in a different video in the getting started uh, section and videos uh, for the uh, Proxmark 3 that we sell. So you can go there or there'll be a link in the description. But, um, you know, what I want to do now is just start the client and we'll go through some stuff. So you can see I've already started Proxspace, which is the environment for Linux tools in Windows, particularly, um, you know, centered around the Proxmark 3. So this uh, prompt that we're at is the Proxmark 3 um, you know, prompt inside Proxspace, but we're not yet in the Proxmark client. So <clears throat> we can do ls or you know, dir is the DOS command version, both work. Um, so we're going to do cd or change directory into Proxmark 3. And uh, now we can see there's some tools in there. This has already been compiled. Um, so we're going to go into the client and then we're going to launch the client, Proxmark 3, and we're on COM3, which is a communications port uh, that appears when you plug in the Proxmark. So you'll see a bunch of stuff flash by, but um, the important part to note is that you know, we have a client version and we have the uh, actual firmware versions under the ARM section, that, and those have to match. So your firmware on the device and the client should match um, if you want to do anything that has any accuracy, because um, if you have a mismatch there, then commands will appear to work, but they don't, or they might not work at all, or just get weird random behavior. Um, but the important part is, again, how to explore the Proxmark. So essentially, um, I think this is going to work. So dash H is the help, and that's going to bring up a menu. And this is something, again, that has been worked on extensively to make this more user-friendly. But there's always going to be a help. Let's say we want to do something with a low-frequency tag. So you can see LF is the low-frequency uh, commands. And we could just type LF and hit enter, and now we get a list of um, things that are applicable for the low frequency um, submenu. So these are things that we can do in the LF um, section of the uh, of the Proxmark client. So you see, there's a lot of options here under low frequency. Um, let's just say that we wanted to work with an AWID um, low frequency tag. So we do LF. I would, and then we just hit enter and we get another sub menu 
Um, now we can see there's um, demod, which we're going to demodulate the signal. We can act as a reader and just extract the tag data, or clone if we want to take an AWID, you know, access card or something, or a key fob and clone it to a T5577. Again, the T5577 chip is a really amazing low-frequency chip that can emulate a lot of different kinds of low-frequency tags and chips. Uh, again, there's going to be a link in the description about that chip. Um, some of our products use it, the, the Next, the XEM, some other ones. Um, but the, that chip's pretty great. So let's say we want to do that. We go LF, AWID, clone. Enter. So now we get a sub, sub, sub menu. So every uh, command subset will be... Uh, will automatically have this help come up if you're not entering the correct parameters. So we can see here if we go LF AWID clone, and then the first thing it's going to want to do is figure out what um, you know modes we want. So we could do the format length. Um, I think probably 26 is a very common uh, length, uh, but then you do dash dash FMT just as it says there. 26 would be the the length. Um, then we want to do um, the facility code. So in a lot of these chip types, they'll break up the ID into facility code and then ID. It's all just binary data on the chip, but we're making these arbitrary distinctions of the first couple of bits are facility code, the last few bits are the ID card value number or whatever. But um, but you can see there's very, it's very clear how to follow this. So um, essentially that's what you do. So if, let's say you did have an AWED uh, card, you would want to do a read first. And I, I might actually have an Outwood card. Uh, let me go dig one up just for fun. Okay, I do have one. I'm going to make a collection of different types of LF cards just to make a separate video about how to do the cloning uh, part and how you would read the ID, interpret it, and then clone it to another tag. So that's in another video. But the point of this video is just to show how you can explore these different things um, when it comes to how to use the Proxmark. So let's do LF again. This is an interesting uh, capability, but I wanted to see the very last thing here is LF tune. And what this does is it gives you a measure of what's happening with the LF antenna. So I'm going to take an LF um, key fob and watch the value of that, uh, the millivolts value, change as I present the tag. You can see that it goes down significantly because the tag is now inducting a lot of power from the antenna and it's, there's less voltage available to be measured. So that's just giving you an idea of how well a thing or a tag or, or a transponder can couple with that antenna. This becomes very important when you start dealing with things like little um, you know, glass tags and things. So let me, let me grab one of those and I'll show that. Okay, so what I have here is a Next, and this has both HF and LF chips inside and they're on either side of the tube. So I wanted to see if we can determine which side uh, just by looking at the millivolt drop. So we have um, 37 volts approximately, and we'll present this. We can see, oh, <clears throat> very clearly it drops um, significantly on that side of the tube. But then if I change it around and use this side, uh, it's still dry. Ooh, even further. Maybe that's maybe that's the side. It's very hard uh, because they're so close together and they're actually coupled together in the tube a little bit to to improve tuning of both. But the important thing I want to show is the difference between you know maybe placing it here and placing it here. You can see there's a significant difference placing it on the side um, versus placing it in the center. Well, in this case, actually, there's not much difference. It really depends on how close, I believe that's the LF tube, and uh, how close it gets from the center. So there's 33, actually. That's the best positioning, 32 even. Oh, you know what it was? <laughs> this is funny. So I was touching uh, these poles with my finger, which reduces the voltage because I'm providing a short. Um, so best not to touch those poles when you're actually doing things, and that's... An important um, thing to know too, if you're going to set this uh, down on any metal surface or any kind of uh, like a MacBook Pro that has a metal surface, you would be shorting out the antenna poles which connect this LF antenna together. So not a good idea to do that. So I'm just going to hold it uh, carefully and then present in the center. You can see not much is happening, but as I move to the side, it drops and back to the center. And over this way, it drops and back to the center. So that's more of what we should expect to see. <laughs> you really want to get this over over the um, antenna 
you know, windings in a perpendicular fashion to get maximum coupling. But this is important to show just where and how to position um, these types of tags. So yeah, careful of those poles. And you might want to actually rubberize this uh, whole bottom piece, maybe if you're going to be setting it on things uh, where it could short. So that's important. Overall, this has been just a quick introduction to the Proxmark. Just wanted to show how to explore the command set and the menus and some important factors about how to actually use the antennas. Um, other videos will actually go over how to clone things, how to um, read source tags, and uh, even how to investigate some uh, you know, particularly vulnerable uh, old legacy type chips when it comes to their access keys and security.